Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following two major stories tonight. A massive out-of-control wildfire in the Texas panhandle is rapidly spreading at this hour. There are homes damaged and evacuations. We'll have the very latest in just a few minutes. But we do begin tonight in Michigan, where all polls have now closed in dueling primaries. And tonight, a possible warning sign for President Joe Biden. Democrats who were unhappy with President Biden's response to Israel's continuing military operation in Gaza had urged voters to vote uncommitted instead of for him. At this hour, ABC News can project President Biden will win the Michigan primary. But taking a look right now at those results, you can see um, more than 17,000 uh, Michigan voters chose to vote uncommitted instead of for Joe Biden, who received 83,000, uh, a little more than 83,000 votes. Michigan is, of course, a hotly contested swing state and always looms large in November. On the Republican side, ABC News can project Donald Trump will win the Republican primary there in Michigan. Uh, and take a look now. We can see that Donald Trump is beating Nikki Haley uh, by more than 40,000 points with 65% of the vote there. So let's get right to political director Rick Klein. And Rick, we'll, we'll talk about Trump in a moment, but we do have to get back to what is shaping up to be the story of the night here. President Biden and these uncommitted voters, organizers had sort of hoped for 10,000 votes, which was about the difference in Donald Trump's 2016 win over Hillary Clinton in Michigan. They got more than that. Should President Biden be concerned tonight? Yeah, Lindsay, and they, they set a little bit of a low ball estimate, but they do appear to be far above that pace. Take a look at what we're seeing so far. With only about 10% of the vote in, we're at about 17,000 uncommitted. Let's say that holds in the rest of the state. You're talking about uh, potentially more votes. That's that would be 170,000 votes. Joe Biden only won the state by about 150,000 votes in 2020. So this is a significant chunk of voters. And just looking at some of the counties here, Ann Arbor, the college town there where the University of Michigan is, uncommitted is almost a quarter of the vote in. We're still waiting on returns in Detroit and right outside there where Dearborn is. That's where Rashida Tlaib, the congresswoman, had been part of this, this protest movement. So there's a lot of votes still in. We'll see if these numbers fluctuate. But this is going to be a major message that's delivered to Joe Biden tonight by Michigan Democratic primary voters. You don't know that they're necessarily going to vote for Trump, but they're certainly making their presence known. And Governor Gretchen Whitmer said ahead of tonight, quote, I would say the train is out of the station. Get on board. But it appears a decent amount of people aren't on board. So now what? Yeah, look, the question is what those voters decide to do, and it, do they, are they just happy with this message being received? You know, there's not another candidate out there. Dean Phillips down there with just about 2% of the vote. Uh, uncommitted means there could be delegates sent to the National Convention that are not Joe Biden delegates, but they're not going to really be able to do anything. This is their strong statement that they're making. The question is how that message is received, and is there anything that happens in the conduct of the Israel-Hamas conflict that changes the perceptions of these voters, because they are letting people know tonight that they exist, and they are in Michigan, and they're willing to show up and vote. Uh, we are now one week away from Super Tuesday. Does that change at all anything, or I should say, does anything that you've seen tonight change the calculus for Donald Trump or Nikki Haley? Yeah, no, look, Donald Trump is, is once again going to be romping through the state. Keep in mind, Nikki Haley got about 40 percent of the vote in South Carolina. She's right now tracking uh, significantly below that. We know that she went to a couple places in the state, including Oakland County, just north of Detroit, some of the suburbs there. And it's about where the statewide total is. So we don't see any evidence that she's cutting into the margins. And it means she's going to go into this next round of voting, this huge swath of states voting over the next week, significantly behind. She's only truly focusing on a small handful of states to pick up a few delegates here or there. It doesn't look like Michigan is going to break that trend. She is still not anywhere mathematically on a track toward the nomination. And Nikki Haley herself wasn't able to name a state that she confidently felt that she could win. Are there any tea leaves out there, any indicators to you that there are some states that she might possibly be able to squeak out a, a yeah, victory? Don't hold your breath. Maybe the District of Columbia, where, 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 there's, where the Republicans are, are a little bit different than the rest of the country. Uh, this right now is, is a strategy to try to just go to a few places and really send a message, Lindsay. This campaign is not the kind of national campaign that, that goes in there and says we're going to win in a bunch of places. They do not have that realistic path. This is Donald Trump's nomination to lose. Before I let you go, anything that surprised you tonight? Look, I, I do think on the Democratic side, if you start to if you start to get into what this really represents, we just haven't seen anything like this before. Uh, there's a history in Michigan of uncommitted being a thing, but nothing on the scale that we're uh, we're seeing tonight. Again, we'll see if these returns hold as the night goes on. But this is a this is a major development and and the first real opportunity for Democrats to vent their frustration, whatever it is, with what the man that is now the presumptive nominee. 
Certainly, uh, we would imagine that they're going to get uh, President Biden's attention. Uh, Rick, thank you. In the Thanks. primaries ahead and the general election, leaders of the Democratic Party will no doubt seek to unify the party and minimize dissent like what we're seeing in Michigan now, uh, with potentially tens of thousands of Democrats voting uncommitted. Joining us now is ABC News contributor Alencia Johnson. Alencia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you were a senior advisor to the Biden-Harris campaign in 2020. Uh, what do the uncommitted voters tell you about the Democratic base in general? Well, listen, I think the uncommitted voters are sending a clear message that, one, first of all, this doesn't mean that they want to necessarily vote for Donald Trump, but there is a significant population that is extremely frustrated with the president's handling of what's happening in Israel and Palestine. They have said, point blank, period, that not calling for a ceasefire and continuing to fund the war goes against their principles, goes against the humanity that they believe in, whether it's the Arab and Muslim population that have families over uh, in the Middle East or young progressive voters or even black voters who really want to see the U.S. take a harder stance and call for a ceasefire, not even a temporary one, but a permanent one in this war. But the other thing that we have to talk about, too, in the uncommitted voters is that there are a range of issues that people are challenged on when trying to get on board with President Biden's reelection. It doesn't tell us that Democrats can't make up that gap between now and election day. But I do think that the Biden campaign has to listen to these voters and not just necessarily say, as many of the surrogates have been saying, hey, just get on the train and it's already going and actually listen to what these voters want. There's a lot of time to do that between now and the convention. Um, and I hope that uh, folks are paying attention based on these uh, returns. In your experience working with Democratic campaigns, should President Biden's team be worried about preventing similar movements to vote uncommitted in un upcoming primaries? Listen, as the Democratic Party actually believes in democracy, this is part of the democratic process to let your voice be heard in the ballot box. And we welcome, or we should at least welcome these conversations to happen in the primaries. And so I, I do think we could potentially see this in other, uh, in other primary states, but I actually think this is going to uh, become an issue or something to be talked about when it comes to convention as well as building the party platform, which is part of what this uncommitted coalition has wanted folks to do, is to pay attention as we go into the convention, as we go into what is the party platform uh, in order for uh, Joe Biden to hopefully get reelected at the end of this year. And of course, as you suggested, all of the people who are voting uncommitted tonight doesn't necessarily mean it's all about the ceasefire. But what would your guidance be if you were in the ear of, of the Biden administration tonight? Listen, I would continue to tell them to do what they have started to do, which is uh, send some of their officials, both campaign officials as well as policy officials, which is really what people want is a shift in policy to Michigan to listen to voters and go further than the temporary ceasefire. That is particularly what this Democratic base wants. The majority of the Democratic base, not just in Michigan, actually support a ceasefire. And so whether or not the president is going to call for that, he should directly have a conversation with the nation about it. I also think that the campaign needs to pay attention to why some voters just haven't gotten on board yet. Listen, President Biden is a historic president. I think he's done a great job for the most part on a lot of issues, uh, doing a lot of great work. But some people feel as though they haven't heard from this White House or they haven't heard from the campaign on what he's doing, as well as going a lot, being a lot firmer on what he will do when it comes to abortion rights. There's the IVF case that happened in Alabama. There's a lot of opportunity there. What's happening with immigration and Republicans squandering on uh, a bipartisan legislation. There are a lot of opportunities for this president to go forward and talk about uh, an empowering campaign of what he would do should he get uh, a second term and not just make this case about beating Donald Trump again. Come general election time, and assuming it's another Biden versus Trump race, do you anticipate that many of tonight's uncommitted Democratic voters will eventually bite the bullet and, and vote for Biden? 
My short answer is I do. However, they're going to need to hear directly from the president uh, how he plans to engage them in this coalition. Listen, the 2020 race is completely different than the 2024 race. We've already ran the campaign that was to defeat Donald Trump. Now voters want to know what they are voting for. Empower voters on the issues that they care about. We have tons of polling, tons of elections between 2020 and now from the midterms to the local races that have shown us the issues that voters care about, the issues that will turn out voters. And so we have to run an offensive campaign on all of that because running against Donald Trump is not going to be enough, enough to get Democrats over the line. Lencia Johnson, so appreciate your input. Thank you. Joining us now for more, ABC's Jay O'Brien. Jay, no shock that President Biden won in Michigan, but there are discussions around a growing protest vote against him among Democrats. It's really garnered a lot of attention. Uh, tell us how unique that is. Well, it's interesting because you heard Rick allude to this a little bit. There have been uncommitted movements before in Democratic primaries. One of the most notable, perhaps the most analogous example, although this is on its own, obviously, is Obama in 2012 in Michigan and some other states. So if you think back to 2012, about 43 percent of the vote in a state like Kentucky voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary versus voting for President Obama. Uh, that was a protest vote amongst rural voters. That movement made its way to Michigan as well, where about 10 percent of the vote, or about 20,000 voters, voted uncommitted as a protest vote again against then-President Obama. The Biden campaign, I can tell you, in the ramp up to the primary today, has been pointing that out and saying, look, uncommitted as a ballot option has gotten more than 10,000, which was their goal tonight, votes before. Uh, but I was just talking to Rick, who, who through the magic of television, is right across the hall from me, and they looked to, as he noted in his live shot there, surpass well more than 20,000, which was that Obama benchmark in 2012. You're looking at them potentially in the hundreds of thousands here. So while this has happened before, they will have numbers unseen in a Michigan Democratic primary, at least in the last few years, and frankly, in our research in the modern political era of this uncommitted type ballot question, at least in Michigan and some other states, the numbers have been different. But point being, this is something that the Biden campaign, given the numbers tonight, is going to have to take seriously, Lindsay. How much of this uncommitted vote do you see as, as a threat to Joe Biden's candidacy ultimately in Michigan for the general election, which he won with less than three percentage points back in 2020, by the way? And I think that's the million dollar question. So it's really going to be a numbers game. So remember, that 3% equates to about 154,000 votes. That's Biden's win over Trump in 2020 in Michigan. A rare kind of election year because of COVID and all of that, but still, that's the metric we have. If uncommitted gets more than 150,000 votes tonight or near that, that becomes something that the Biden campaign has to look at and say, well, we can't lose tens of thousands of votes, which was the concern tonight. But if they lose more than 100,000 votes in a general or those voters stay home or even a chunk of them, that's a complicating factor for President Biden. I can tell you, though, I, I talked to some Democratic sources tonight ahead of the primary before we started to get vote totals. They are of the belief that a large chunk of these voters will eventually find their way back to President Biden when they finally go into that voting booth or they vote by mail or they vote in whatever fashion they were going to vote in. And they believe that because of, of the the issues that President Biden is campaigning on and is going to continue to campaign on, abortion rights, for instance, economic strength, and frankly, what the campaign has, de has demonstrated is what they believe is a risk to democracy posed by the likely Republican candidate, Donald Trump. So they believe that those three factors, amongst others, like the union presence in Michigan and things of that nature, will eventually bring some of those uncommitted voters back into the Biden fold. But I can tell you, we've even heard calls from Michigan Democrats already who say the campaign is going to have to do some work, is going to have to listen to these voters' concerns in order to actually make that happen. It's a red flag, if nothing else. But I am curious if you think that this narrative playing out in Michigan of the protest votes against Biden, if it shines a light on a bigger national issue that, that could impact him in November. 
Well, it's kind of a two-tiered question as to its impact nationally. First, it, it cannot be overstated how much Michigan is a state that President Biden has to win in order to win the presidency again. It was one of those states in 2020, as you noted earlier in the broadcast, that catapulted him to the presidency like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, et cetera. Uh, so not doing well in Michigan is going to have a ripple effect if it happens across the campaign. But from a national perspective, you also have to look at, at where where we end up in vote total tonight and, and the strength of this uncommitted movement, does it serve as a kind of watchword and bellwether for other Democrats now in other, other primaries or in the convention or other forums in which they can vent frustration to say, look what was done in Michigan and look what we may be able to do if those progressives have policy disagreements with the Biden campaign as these progressives did in Michigan tonight. I, I can tell you though, again, the Biden campaign campaign believes that this Michigan issue will be kind of a one-off, A, because of the democratic uh, demographic makeup of the state, rather, and B, because the state has had a history with some kind of uncommitted movements in previous primaries. But it remains to be seen if there is strength in this uncommitted vote tonight, which it looks like there's going to be, if it inspires other movements in other states or, or other kinds of forums in the Democratic Party. Jay O'Brien, always appreciate your context. Thank you so much. And we will, of course, continue following the results in the Michigan primary and the impact that it could ultimately have. But we do now turn to that dire emergency in the panhandle. A series of wildfires there exploding in size tonight. Homes have been damaged. Residents are sheltering in place. And it could be a long night ahead. One fire, the Smokehouse Creek Fire, in the northern part of the state has quadrupled in size in 24 hours. At least 250,000 acres are now burning, fueled by fierce winds from a cross-country storm. The fire has already jumped highways in the area and traveled 36 miles from where it started. Governor Abbott issued a state of emergency and a disaster declaration a short time ago. Officials say evacuations are underway. We're all watching that wind tonight. Ginger Z has more on that in a moment. But First, our Maria Villarreal has the latest from Texas. Tonight, howling winds and thick smoke filling the skies in the Texas panhandle with four major wildfires burning out of control. Four, five, we can't hold it. Get out of there. Let's pull out. We got too many spots. The entire city of Canadian, northeast of Amarillo, surrounded by flames. Authorities tonight saying there are no exits out, asking everyone to shelter in place. But it's burning up all around it. It is ripping it towards Scott's Acres. Officials shutting down roads. Head back. We're just going to have to regroup. We can't, we can't stop it. The largest inferno, the Smokehouse Creek Fire, quadrupling in size in less than 24 hours, scorching more than 200,000 acres, and it's 0% contained. Misty West and her family now fleeing their home in Pampa, Texas, with their two dogs. It just moves so fast. Look at that is awful. More than 40 homes damaged in Fritch, Texas. The hot, dry conditions fueling fires across the plains from Texas to Nebraska and Colorado, where a fire Monday threatened the Air Force Academy near Colorado Springs. Just surreal scenes there. Our thanks to Maria for that. And now I want to bring in Assistant Fire Chief Stephen Skipper at Lipscomb County. He joins us from the firehouse there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we know that you've been sending all your help to the heart of where the fire started in Hemp Hill County. Uh, what's the latest that you're hearing on the status of those fires? Well, you know, that's, that fire actually started in Hutchison County over by um, Stinnett, Texas, and it traveled east almost 100 miles all the way to the Oklahoma line through uh, Roberts County, uh, Ockletree County, burned into Hemphill County, uh, got into Lipscomb County, and then the wind shifted from the north and blew it into the town of Canadian. That's when uh, the city of Canadian ordered their evacuation and uh, now the fire, as it's through Canadian, the last update I heard, which was a while ago, it's on the Canadian or the Hemphill Wheeler County line and the towns in Wheeler County and even farther south of there are uh, evacuating. And you mentioned those evacuations. Is there any concern that the people are trapped by the flames? You know, uh, there there is. In Canadian, you know, there's really only one way in and one way out as far as the highways go there, and uh, it's kind of in a canyon. 
exit? Is it typical? The northern, the northern exit was cut off earlier in the day. And then this afternoon, I think before a lot of people were able to get out of town, the southern exit was also cut off by fire. So I know at one point they were sending residents to the football field to try to take shelter. Uh, it's harder to burn short grass, I guess. And then uh, several shelters in town were set up and they advised residents to shelter in place at that time. Is it typical for Texas to experience fires like these in February? You know, this is a big one. This is, uh, I would call this atypical, but it's definitely typical that we get big fires every year. Uh, this year, it seems to be especially bad. We've got a lot of uh, overgrown vegetation. We had unusually high levels of rainfall this summer. And then, uh, you know, when that dries out and dies in the wintertime, it just creates an enormous fuel load on the ground that makes these situations really dangerous when we get these high winds and low humidity like we saw yesterday and today. What's the most important thing that you want people to remember as these wildfires are breaking out? I think people should remember that people are going to need help. You know, I think the people that live out here, they understand what they need to do to protect themselves and try to protect their property. But what I'd like everybody watching, everybody listening to remember is that these People affected by these fires, I know I know several people personally that have lost their homes in Canadian. I know some of my family members have lost their home there. Uh, these people are gonna need help and there's gonna be ways to do that. These little towns in Texas always set up um, funds at the banks and at the churches. And if you just follow the local fire departments, follow the Canadian uh, volunteer fire department on Facebook, I know they're gonna post those ways to help there. And then remember that these, these volunteer fire departments are 100% staffed by volunteers who are leaving their jobs and leaving their families to do this work. And then they're totally funded by donations. So after a fire like this, their equipment is often, our equipment at the Booker Fire Department suffers damage every time we do something like this. And a lot of times it's, it's up to the firefighters themselves who are already volunteering their time to come in and make those repairs. Uh, with the limited funding that they have. So the fire departments are going to need help and the people affected by the fires are going to need a lot of help. So I would just say, if you're going to remember one thing, remember to look for ways to help the people that need it. We appreciate those reminders. I can imagine a number of people are going to want to help out. Assistant Fire Chief Skipper, we thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. A massive cross-country storm is now heading east. A dangerous night ahead for 40 million Americans on alert from Missouri to Michigan. A tornado watch even issued for Chicago. A snow squall in Denver causing a ground stop, delaying nearly 400 flights. Heavy rain expected tomorrow for D.C., Philly, New York, and Boston. Ginger Z now with the overnight tornado threat and what the I-95 corridor can expect. Hey, Ginge. Hey, Lindsay, just moments ago, we saw our first warning pop within that tornado watch uh, just out south and east of Davenport, Iowa. So it's in Illinois, and that's where most of that watch is until 10 p.m. tonight, but it also includes Kenosha and parts of northwest, Wisconsin, or northwest Indiana. Let's go ahead and broaden out, though, because this is not the only area that's on alert tonight. Into the overnight hours, those nocturnal tornadoes can be so... Uh, devastating. Have two ways of getting warnings if you live anywhere in Orange, from Missouri through southern Illinois, Indiana, much of northwestern Kentucky and Cincinnati. You're also included. So that's just the overnight. Then that front keeps marching east and with it will come big wind. We're talking gusts of 45 and 60 from Maine back to Texas, all of Tennessee, West Virginia, Virginia, and right here in the northeast because ahead of it we've got this serious temperature gradient where at this extreme heat um, the severe storms are going to still be lingering in the morning hours and and then it just becomes this kind of broad line. You could still see some really gusty winds along the storms there, but it's the heavy rain from Dover and Washington, D.C., right up through Philadelphia tomorrow evening. Behind it, it's cold for a brief moment, but wow, what a flip. When we talk whiplash, some of these are rivaling the strongest and, and quickest turnarounds for temperatures. St. Louis went to 86 today. That is by far the warmest February temperature they have ever had, and now they'll drop to 26, 60 degrees in just about 12 hours. Lindsay. Weather whiplash there. All right, Ginger, our thanks to you. Still much more of today's top stories on Prime coming up T-minus three days until a government shutdown, but could it be avoided? We're in Washington following a high-stakes meeting between the president and congressional leaders. But next, tomorrow, the Supreme Court will take on the battle over bump stocks. We speak to the creator who discusses his device publicly for the first time. Your critics say that that's violating the spirit of the law. 
that even though that may not technically be a machine gun, it certainly does look like one. Well, it sounds like Congress needs to rewrite the definition of a machine gun, doesn't it? Here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. To gun enthusiasts, it's a toy for having fun. To safety advocates, it turns a weapon into a killing machine. The bump stock was banned by the Trump administration in 2018 after playing a role in America's deadliest mass shooting. Now the U.S. Supreme Court will decide its fate. Tonight in our Prime Focus, we hear for the first time exclusively from the creator of the bump stock, who's defending his invention and the legal campaign to get it back on store shelves. Our Devin Dwyer reports from Knoxville, Tennessee. Coy! Yep! Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. He's a son of West Texas turned cattle rancher in the mountains of Tennessee. Come on, mamas. To some, Jeremiah Cottle is an American hero. I've got my air medal, my aerial achievement medal, my NATO medal. To his critics, the father of four is a promoter of mass death. How did you conceive of the bump stock? I wanted to create a way that people could go out and shoot their guns safely and have fun and and shoot similar to, to shoot as fast as you want to be able to shoot. Like so, a machine gun. Similar, yes, but not quite like that. You can take pretty much any semi-automatic firearm and then using a technique, you can make that gun shoot extremely fast. So it's like a poor man's machine gun. Oh uh, yeah, pull that pin down and it slides right on. Cottle is the inventor of the bump stock, the non-mechanical device that harnesses the recoil power of a semi-automatic rifle to fire shots in rapid succession. This is the original. This was the original one, yep. The original prototype hangs in the office of Cottle's Tennessee estate. A simple piece of wood, PVC piping, and duct tape concocted in 2009 while he was recovering from a brain injury after his military service. 
But this is the model in February of 2010 that I actually sent to the ATF and that they approved. For so eight years, the government approved its stop. sale and patents protected its design. I'm very proud of what I do. That despite a 1986 I, federal ban on the production of machine guns for civilian use and heavy restrictions on those already in circulation. How many rounds a minute can you fire with a bump stock? As fast as the gun will go. So the bump stock helps you shoot faster, more accurately. Correct. The National Firearms Act, which sort of severely restricts machine guns, do you see the bump stock as getting around those limits? No, because it doesn't meet the definition of a machine gun. He sold his first 500 bump stocks in just four days, more than 20,000 in the first year. Sales that made Cottle, who was on food stamps at the time, almost instantly a millionaire. His small business employed more than 40, including his grandparents. You take an individual with an idea, something that they believe others will enjoy, you put it out there and it's unbelievably welcomed. So these aren't used for hunting, these are simply used in your view for having fun yes. in the woods, spraying bullets into the trees or yeah. the targets. That's exactly what it's for. And it's as simple as lining that, the bump fire stock up with the buffer tube and then sliding it on the gun. You pull the trigger, it fires one time, it recoils, and you pull the trigger again to fire the next one. What my product does is just allows you to do that very quickly. All right, going hot. Eyes and ears, range is hot. Okay. If this was a fully automatic weapon, if this was a machine gun, mm -hmm. and you pulled the trigger once, what would happen? It would just keep shooting. It would just, bullets would keep flying until bullets you let go. Correct. What makes the bump stock fire repeatedly? It's your left hand? The left hand moving the trigger forward into your stationary finger that pulls the trigger each and every round. In October 2017, the deadly power of a bump stock came into horrifying view. Investigators concluded a gunman in Las Vegas who killed 60 people and injured more than 500 at a music festival had guns equipped with bump stocks. Sisters Marissa Morano and Gina Springman were shot at in the crowd that day. When the fireworks stopped and we got up and I said, run, Gina Ann, run. And, you know, we ran over people. I, I vividly remember the girl, I call her, in her denim skirt and her white top with blood on it. And I, I ran over her. I couldn't stop. You know, we were running over bodies. It is still America's deadliest mass shooting. So horrific that even the NRA called for greater regulation of bump stocks. And then President Trump called on the ATF to issue an outright ban. As a survivor, to know that you experienced this life-changing event, that you could have um, been killed, our mother could have lost two daughters that night, we need it to be regulated. Um, this converts an assault weapon into a machine gun. For years, the ATF had concluded that a bump stock was not an illegal machine gun, allowing the sale of more than 700,000 nationwide. Right. There's case. nothing automatic about this. But in 2018, the agency changed course. And how does that compare to a fully automatic weapon you used to fire in combat? Very close. Steve Kling, a retired Army commander of a small arms training unit and gun safety advocate, says ATF's reversal was a more accurate analysis of federal law. And when you see the bump stack, you see what? A toy that can add an incredible level of lethality to a weapon that has no practical use whatsoever. There's no question that they're fun. It's fun to drive a supercar at 180 miles an hour down a highway, but we don't allow that either. And you're saying a bump stock violates, if not the technical requirements of the law, certainly the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is to prevent automatic weapons, weapons that have a significant cyclical rate of fire to be on our streets and possessed by just anyone. It violates both. At Central Texas Gunworks outside Austin, bump stocks have been off the shelves since the ATF ordered them surrendered or destroyed. Grab that slide, push up. Owner Michael Cargill, an Army veteran and gun safety instructor, is now leading the fight to bring them back. 
this is a product that I legally purchased, you know, and had it, you know, in the store, and someone else purchased this product and they had it in their home, uh, and all of a sudden, an agency within the federal government decided they're going to ban this particular product. And I said, this is crazy. This is not the America that I know. We've got to do something about this. Stance, grip, sights. Cargill insists a bump stock is a firearm accessory and that the ATF overstepped its authority. Look at your sight. He's now asking the Supreme Court to strike down the agency's ban. There are people who, if they got their hands on the bump stock, can make an already dangerous weapon a lot more dangerous. We need to follow the laws that we already have right now and not venture out past that point. An agency within the federal government can't come out and actually turn millions of people into felons overnight or ban a product. We have to go through Congress to do that. It doesn't sound like, Jeremiah, you have any weight on your conscience about a potential connection between the bump stock and what happened in Las Vegas. No. I believe people that are bent on violence will achieve violence regardless of the tools they use. If one of your kids was shot, even killed, by someone in a mass shooting event using a bump stock, would you feel differently? I'm sure I would. I don't know. That's a hard question to answer because I don't want to pretend like I can sit in those people's shoes. Jeremiah Cottle says he may soon get out of the bump stock business, even though a high court victory could once again help him rake in millions. Did you find your food? He says more than anything, the Supreme Court showdown is about vindicating his right. version. Looks like we got everybody fed this morning. Of the American dream. It gave me the opportunity to do something amazing, to create a business, to get my children off of food stamps, to actually employ people so that they could have good jobs. I'll just stand right here. All right, line's hot. Your critics say that that's violating the spirit of the law, that even though that may not technically be a machine gun, it certainly does look like one. Well, it sounds like Congress needs to rewrite the definition of a machine gun, doesn't it? Let's not start making stuff up on a whim. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer, and still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Ahead of Super Tuesday, a new poll reveals one of voters' top concerns is immigration. And it's not just the border states. We take a look by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and, of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. In 2017, the Trump administration attempted to end temporary protected status to more than 400,000 migrants in the U.S. Though the Biden administration rescinded most of those plans, only today did TPS holders officially declare victory by ending a six-year lawsuit. Immigration remains top of mind for Americans nonetheless. And we're taking a look in tonight's By the Numbers. When Americans were asked to name the country's most important problem, 20% in January said immigration. That number jumped this month to 28%, according to Gallup's latest survey. Respondents who identified as Republican caused the uptick. 37% of Republicans in January cited immigration as America's top problem. But in February, that number jumped to 57 percent. It's been almost five years since immigration ranked as America's top concern. For 11 months straight in 2023, Americans actually named government itself as the most important problem facing the country. This month, right behind immigration and government, 12 percent of respondents named the economy in general as the biggest problem, and 11 percent named inflation. And it's important to note that more migrants, that does not translate into higher unemployment. The unemployment rate in the U.S. out side of the pandemic years has remained essentially flat since 2018. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. New developments in the trial over District Attorney Fonnie Willis's personal relationship with one of her prosecutors as the court considers whether to disqualify her from the Trump-RICO trial there. And we sit down with the power trio from Poor Things and discuss their road to the Oscars. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. 
the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. We are, of course, following the primary in Michigan and what it could mean for President Biden and the race for the Republican nomination. But we move on to the high-stakes misconduct hearing involving Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis. She brought the election interference case in Georgia against Donald Trump and multiple alleged co-conspirators. Willis is accused of having a romantic relationship with a prosecutor she hired for the case. On the stand today was that prosecutor's former divorce lawyer and law partner. Did he contradict Willis's statement? Here's Aaron Katursky. For more than two hours today, attorneys for Donald Trump and his co-defendants in Georgia tried to prove District Attorney Fonnie Willis lied about her romance with the man she hired to run the case, grilling a key witness, the former law partner of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, about the timing of the relationship. But Terrence Bradley testified repeatedly he did not know. When did the relationship start? I cannot answer that. I don't know when the relationship started. At that point, had they begun their romantic relationship? I don't recall any, any specific uh, dates. Bradley was confronted with his own text messages, saying the romance started before Willis hired Wade. And when I asked you if you thought it started before she hired him, and you responded, absolutely. But today, Bradley said in those texts, he was only speculating. Why would you speculate when she was asking you a direct question about when the relationship started? I have no answer for that. Except for the fact that you do, in fact, know when it started, and you don't want to testify to that in court. No, I have no direct knowledge of when the relationship started. Bradley's inconsistent account raises questions, since Willis and Wade testified their romance began after he started working on the Trump case. In November of 2021, I hired him. I do not consider our relationship to have become romantic until early of 2022. She's trying to be very clear about that timeline. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, why is the timing of Willis's relationship with Wade so critical? It really is important because to get Fonnie Willis kicked off this case, defense attorneys for Donald Trump and his co-defendants would have to prove that she somehow profited by hiring Wade. Maybe so he could afford to take her on nicer vacations. The judge is going to hear closing arguments about all of this on Friday. Lindsay. All right, Aaron Katursky for us, our thanks to you. The clock is ticking tonight to a possible government shutdown on Friday. The intense Oval Office meeting today, the president with leaders of Congress from both parties. ABC's Rachel Scott with late reporting on the Hill about the president and the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, then meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Tonight, President Biden calling the top Democratic and Republican congressional leaders to the White House to try to prevent a partial government shutdown just three days from now. Figure out how we're going to keep uh, 
funding the government, which is an important problem, an important solution we need to find, and I think we can do that. Afterward, no breakthrough. But Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson sounding a B. We're very optimistic. But few signs of progress on the president's other major goal, passing new funding for Ukraine. The meeting on Ukraine was one of the most intense I have ever encountered in my many meetings in the Oval Office. Democratic Senate leader Chuck Schumer describing how all the leaders in the room tried to convince Johnson to stop stalling and support new Ukraine funding. The five of us, the president, the vice president, Leader McConnell, Speaker, uh, Leader Jeffries and myself, made it so clear how vital this was to the United States and that we couldn't afford to wait a month or two months or three months because we, we would in all likelihood lose the war. The president even keeping Johnson behind for a private one-on-one -on -one meeting. But when the speaker emerged from the White House, he made it clear he's not budging on Ukraine unless there's more spending on border security. But it was Speaker Johnson himself who killed the bipartisan plan to strengthen the border. And he did it at the urging of Donald Trump, who didn't want Biden to notch a win on immigration, an issue he wants to run on in November. Today outside the White House, Speaker Johnson not even mentioning the word Ukraine. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Uh, Rachel, on the issue of a potential government shutdown, funding is said to run out late Friday night. Where do things stand at this moment? Yeah, well, Lindsay, here we go again. This will be down to the wire. Some far-right House Republicans say they will not agree to keep the government funded unless Democrats agree to a long list of conservative policy changes. They are calling those a non-starter. The good news here is that congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle say it is their utmost priority that they want to avert this government shutdown, and they are optimistic they can get it done by the end of the week, Lindsay. All right, we will be seeing, uh, counting down the days here, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Macy's announced today it will close 150 stores over the next three years. Macy's is aiming to upgrade its remaining 350 stores with plans to add more salespeople to fitting rooms and shoe departments. The company also signaled they would open 15 of its higher-end Bloomingdale stores and 30 of its luxury Blue Mercury cosmetic locations, which Macy's owns. Meanwhile, Sony announced it will cut about 900 jobs in its PlayStation's unit as layoffs in technology and the gaming sector continue. These layoffs account for roughly 8% of its global workforce. Now to a trio of Oscar nominees that you'll want to spend some time with. One of this year's breakout films was Poor Things, a reimagining of the classic Frankenstein flipped into a feminist fantasy coming of age all set in a fantastical world. The film earned 11 Oscar nods, including Best Picture, Best Actress in a Leading Role for Emma Stone, Best Supporting Actor for Mark Ruffalo, and Best Adapted Screenplay for writer Tony McNamara. In our road to the Oscars, I sat down with the three to talk about the boundary-busting movie and just how unique the filming experience was for them all. This is Bella. Bye, bye. Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Hello, Bella. Emma, let's start with you. You have talked about Bella Baxter as probably the greatest character you'll ever get to play. How so? She's just not comparable to anyone because she doesn't have a history. She's discovering the world in a brand new way every second of every day. I am Bella Baxter, and there is a world to enjoy, circumnavigate. She's so special. I don't know that I'll ever get a chance to, to play someone that doesn't have shame and doesn't have self-judgment. It's just so free. And Mark, we don't often see you in a villain role. One writer put it that it's the extremely punchable Duncan. What did oh. you think about taking on that, that kind of villain? I just found it to be <laughs> incredibly freeing and um, light and a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. You're always reading now, Bella. You're losing some of your adorable way of speaking. Unlike any role you've ever played. Totally, completely unlike anything I'd ever done. And I think in a lot of ways, a role that a lot of people uh, thought uh, was surprising. That's really delightful to have that at the latter half of a career, to be able to have people who believe in you to do something you've never done. And you've talked about Bella's role in the way of a growth of a tree. When you first read the script, what were you envisioning of, of her character? I didn't know how any of it was gonna be. I loved the journey of it, and I, and I loved that 
there was a, this woman who was sort of in a, in a 38 year old woman's body, but a child who has no conditioning as a woman and just goes through her life free of all that conditioning that sort of <laughs> dictates who we're supposed to be. What am I doing? It's just every time you say how old Bella is, yeah. like in a number, you age her up. <laughs> <laughs> like at first you were like in a 30 year old woman's body, and then like a, a month goes by and you're like 32, and then you're like 35, and now she's 38. <laughs> like, I'm 30. Right now, but I guess Bella's 38 now. Yeah. Even though this was two years ago when we made it, but it's fine. It's She's just aged funny. Like Benjamin Button's She's aged by eight so years yeah. since you started doing interviews. And, and Tony, when I first sat down, I saw the movie really early before there was any real thought about you know whether this was going to be an Oscar nominee, and I didn't know much about the movie, and I couldn't decide at first: is this a comedy? Is this like a really dark? movie and how did you go about bringing all these genres together? I think it was just that was the trick of the whole piece from the start. It was dark because it had this premise but it was also sort of Frankenstein. This is Bella. She's an experiment. It was a coming of age movie and a comedy but it was a satire about men in control but it was also basically about this wonderful character who just threw herself at life without any of society's fingerprints on her you know and she would just experience things as she experienced them so I think it was like knowing all those pieces and just kind of make it try and make it unified. Emma when you won your Oscar a few years back you talked about how there was still so much that you needed to learn how do you think getting that first win under your belt has changed you as as an actor? I still feel very much like I have a lot of learning and growing and work to do. So it's been really exciting and lucky to be able to kind of, you know, try things and, and to take chances. And also as an actor, you learn really early on that everything is sort of temporary and fleeting. A career goes in many ebbs and flows and you're not always going to get the opportunities that you get in a certain time period. So I know that this is a, a very wonderful time period to be able to make choices because that's really not always the case. How is this movie unlike anything else you've ever done? I think it is unlike anything else because I think the style of it and Yorgos' vision for it was so different. And it always felt like it was a unique piece with unique characters. So and for me, it was... adaptation. And my first, yes, first time I've ever adapted a book. So in that way, it was like a whole new world in a way. And it, cinematically, it was like it felt like we were doing something quite different. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live. is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.